lot of people enter a PVC world uh, without knowing what they are entering into. Let's also try to untangle this puzzle of wealth that people think that they can make in private equity or venture capital from the lowest to the highest. A large private equity firm even offers offers of roughly about 70 LPA. My first question around your HBS MB application is how much does it cost end to end if you now have an uh, estimate of that and what are certain creative ways of sponsoring it if you are not taking a debt? Uh, loan and debt is something which almost everyone takes uh, but HBS also has a very good uh, in endowment fund. How important was GPA? Did you have a good GPA? Did you not? Have you ever thought how will your life look like when you crack McKinsey & Company at an age of 21? What kind of pre-MBA salary can you earn when you actually exit from McKinsey & Company? Can it be worth 1 crore? And how do you go about cracking Howard Business School MBA offer? Hi, if you're new to my channel, then on my channel I talk about all things MBA, all things careers and all things management consulting. So feel free to hit on the subscribe and the notification button so that you get notified whenever I'm bringing free educational content for all of you. And in this Shatakshi show, I'm going to be talking to Subham. Subham is a global governance initiative, which is my organization, a mentor. He has worked at McKinsey & Company. He has worked at Westbridge Capital. And of course, he's going to join Howard Business School this fall as well. I am going to be talking a lot of interesting things that a lot of you actually go through with respect to conundrums, such as picking between software development and management consulting. How do you actually make a career or start your MBA at HPS, so on and so forth. We are going to be dividing this podcast into two parts, part one and part two. And whenever the part two will be out, or if you're watching part two, the part one link will be in the comment section. I really hope that you get to learn, enjoy, and uh, get to educate yourself through this uh, Shatakshi Sharma podcast. 10, 9, I understand after you complete one year at MBB, you start getting offers. Could you talk us through what does your life or day look like at Westbridge? What kind of work do you do? And let's also try to untangle this puzzle of wealth that people think that they can make in private equity or venture capital from the lowest to the highest. Because many a times people think that, hey, I'm going to get the riches of the world. So what is the upper cap, especially as a pre-MBA? And what is the lower cap? So if you could shed light on both of these topics. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, I think Westbridge is kind of one of its kind of firm because um, we are very broad. So we are a crossover fund, meaning that we can invest both in public and private markets. So for us, it is slightly more broader. Uh, so I have actually spent time both on public Indian markets, public US markets. I've also spent time on private equity type deals and venture capital type deals. And just to differentiate for the audience is that private equity deals are more late stage oriented deals or can be buyout deals for more mature companies. And most, most of them are profitable companies whom you are trying to turn around or, you know, bring more value add. And venture capital deals are one where you enter very early on with a small, smaller check size where the company still is building the product or trying to find uh, a product market fit and try to bet on, you know, the growth. So just to differentiate for the audience, but so when, so Westbridge has been across the spectrum and uh, we do not do seed stage deals. So we do not do very early stage, but we come in at a growth stage where series A and above, and we can do it till, uh, you know, leverage buyouts and we also do public markets. So coming back to the question on how I spend my day, I think uh, my day is split across probably three different categories. Uh, first category being new diligences, new reach outs. So speaking, reaching out to founders, understanding their business model, understanding what they are trying to build, trying to understand and diligence that market uh, about competition, about different, you know, um, areas or trends, government schemes, etc. And is that something where we can uh, make money and, you know, become uh, and invest in it. Uh, so that is a new diligence part of things. Uh, second is portfolio management where uh, basically there are a lot of companies where Westbridge has invested in. So, you know, the portfolio is attacked to me, having that constant conversations with founders or 
uh, you know, getting those quarterly updates and having internal reviews about it, that whether this is something like what is working well and what is not working well and trying to help the founder in the business strategy and discussions and maybe helping them with market research. And the third aspect is more around the fund level activity that there's a lot of, you know, internal uh, presentations also, which we keep making for, uh, for our general understanding of the team. And uh, so that is, again, that it happens. And of course, annual meeting happens for our LP. So we uh, help create annual presentations for that. Uh, so those are three broad spectrums. Uh, and of course, when I, when I say new diligences, it also in, it encapsulates uh, expert calls or reaching out to experts and trying to understand uh, from industry leaders about that particular industry and getting that feedback. Uh, so I think that's how I spend my day. I think uh, most of my time goes in new diligences, uh, then portfolio management and the uh, fund related work is very offbeat. It is not something which is regular. So probably 10% of my entire time goes there and the rest 90% is portfolio or new, new diligences. Coming to your second question on, you know, uh, and this is something which, you know, I, I, I'm glad that you asked this. I think a lot of people enter a PVC world uh, without knowing what they are entering into. And to be honest, even you know, I had some sense based on conversations with my seniors. And of course, it's a very, uh, you know, glamorous world to be, if I have to say that, you know, people are consider that, okay, if he or she is in a P or VC fund and, you know, that he has, he or she has like cracked it. It's I, I kind of not, agree, not completely disagree to it, but also not agree to it. Right. And I think there are both sides. Uh, I think one thing which I have realized that as an investor, it takes a lot of time to whether see whether your investing skills are correct or not, right? Because the gestation period is really long. So you don't know whether your bets were right, whether your thought process was right. And coming to the salary question, I think it starts from, let's say, a, you know, a small VC fund probably starts at about 25 LPA to a large private equity firm even offers, um, you know, job of offers of roughly about 70 LPA, but there's a bonus component to it. And the bonus component is much larger compared to a McKinsey, right? And like, for example, McKinsey, the bonus component is only two to three lakhs per annum as a BA. Uh, but in a PE or VC fund, it's about... 60 to like it can range from about 40% to 100% of your uh, base salary. So your net overall salary can range from about 40 LPA to about one crore plus. So of course it's much, much better than a management consulting firm as a pre MBA role. Uh, but of course with that, there's a lot more ownership, a lot more, probably uh, much higher stakes and uh, hence, you know, more intense hours. Got it. Makes sense. I have a follow-up question to it because you just talked about hours. So could you give us a sense of the average hours? That's one. Uh, and mm -hmm. point number two, what are certain good things that you like about your job and what are certain things that you perhaps dislike about your job? So if you could uh, shed more light on that. Yeah, no, sure. I think uh, hours wise, while McKinsey was five days a week, probably 30, 14 hours a day, uh, but it was, but the weekend was yours. But and as you know, most majority of people might know that 2021 was a great fundraise period for the entire Indian startup community. So of course, and I was a part of a VC fund, a PEC fund. So I was quite busy at that time. So it was probably the entire week for all seven days, I was working 14 hours per day, right? So it was, of course, intense. And there were a lot of weeks, which was 100 plus hours as well. So it was very, very intense during that period of time. Uh, but having said that, at now, because, you know, things are more uh, stable and things, you know, are moving at a much uh, slower pace. So I would say roughly about 12 hours per day uh, and six days a week. So that's about 70 to 80 hours per week, roughly, which is not very bad. It is maybe 10% higher than a consulting consultancy firm, right? Uh, so that is that. And coming to the likes and dislikes, I think some... I have had the most amount of learning in these two and a half years than compared to, I think, any other fund or firm I could have joined. Because, of course, as I said, that Westby being a crossover fund, I could I evaluated across things, right from Series A to, so I've done deal sizes of $15 million to $150 million, which is a very, very broad range. And, of course, looked at public markets as well. So it's a very different learning. Everything you have to, you know, be, you have to have a different thought process in every aspect. 
So from that aspect, I think I had a great learning. That's number one. So that's number one thing which I really like. And VC, the VC part of the thing where we are doing early stage deals has actually given me that opportunity to build my own network with other VC funds, with other analysts, etc. And today, I'm, you know, I, I really feel happy about knowing them and having my own personal network, a personal brand, if I have to say. Right? You know, there are people that know that, okay, that Shubham worked at Westbridge. So, hence, uh, that is something which I really like that I got that opportunity. Third, of course, uh, which is probably should have been the first is just meeting exceptional entrepreneurs uh, like you, Sadatshi. Right? You know, that all of, all of you all that uh, inspire me in very different ways of, you know, how to go about building a business, how to, you know, manage a large organization. And of course, you know, look at both uh, financial health as well as creating impact in the society. And I think Westbridge is very focused on, you know, entrepreneurs who are creating an impact, whether it be education, healthcare, fintech, etc. From that aspect also, I think I really love uh, interacting with such entrepreneurs and, you know, building my perspective. Right? Even in, in future, let's say, you know, if I want to start up, then, what kind of a founder I want to be. I think I have numerous such examples from now having those conversations. So I think those are the, you know, things which I really like. And I, of course, the people around me, they're super smart, super, you know, someone whom I can always look up to and great mentors. Uh, so I think those are the, you know, likes. Uh, the dislikes, of course, the intense hours uh, can be, you know, sometimes, of course, can take a toll on you. And it, it, more than a toll, I think it just reduces your time spent with your family and friends, which actually takes a toll on them as well. And hence, you know, that is something which probably I did not completely like or, you know, or something which I could have done maybe better. Um, but other than that, I feel that I did not really have any negative experience from, you know, that, you know, other than that, that, you know, you had to put in those hours. Uh, but that is something which comes with a job. And I think I knew that I was signing up for it. Uh, and it was something which, you know, has actually given me a lot of ways to how to manage my time better. And hopefully, you know, uh, in future, I can learn from it and, you know, be better at this time management part. Got it. That's a very beautiful answer, especially on the hours and the plus and minuses both. With that, we can smoothly transition towards your uh, MB application. My first question around your HBS MB application is, how important was GPA? Did you have a good GPA? Did you not? And if not, then how much were you able to compensate that through GMAT? Because a lot of people have concerns, anxiety around their, especially GPA, because they don't have control over what happened in their undergrad. So could you shed light uh, over that? Correct. Uh, so uh, luckily, I had a good GPA. I had a GPA of 9.46 uh, graduating out of college. So I am uh, I I not surprised. Not... <laughs> no, on. but uh, it was it was just lucky I attended all classes. Maybe that is why. Uh, but uh, so I think that I think I uh, I did not really have that um, you know pain point. But I know a lot of friends who have that pain point, and even they have made it right. And when I said when I say pain point, they have a GPA of let's say eight point five or slightly below eight point five. A a GPA below eight is very tough, given that India is a very competitive pool. It's not because HBS says that, okay, you need an 8, 8 GPA, but it's basically if there's so many same similar profiles, right? And especially as a, you know, uh, general male engineer, uh, there's just so many, there's so many of them, right? Uh, coming from IITs, applying to uh, these top colleges. So it's very hard to differentiate yourself. There are so many people from IITs in a PVC role, you know, doing similar jobs. So how do you differentiate, right? So hence that GPA becomes important. Um, but, uh, and having said that, coming to the GMAT part of things, I've also seen people uh, get into Harvard Business School with a less, with a small, with not a great GMAT score. And when I say not a great GMAT score, with a 710, 720, right? Uh, for just so it's for the audience, I think it, for HBS or any uh, Ivy League school, for a female, it's considered to at least have a 730 and for a male about 740. Um, and I was also stuck in that uh, conundrum and I was almost about to postpone my round one application. But in my last attempt, I got a 760 and I could, uh, you know, pull through round one. But, uh, but that is, but having said that, I think GMAT is the last thing which they look at. So, of course, focus, focus on that is very important. But 
you do not have to really, if you have a very strong profile, if you have a very strong story, you can still pull through and, you know, actually make a great case for yourself. Got it. Thank you so much, Shubham. Shubham, sorry, for sharing those outliers because that gives hope to people. But of course, they, you have to compensate it through good applications and good stories. I almost am about to ask you the last question that I have my, uh, my mind on. I have always maintained, especially in the Indian MB ecosystem, I'm not sure if you have evaluated the market, there are more than 5,500 MBA and only 7% mm -hmm. generate employable students. Uh, that's why we always say that don't put in 20 lakhs and above of that money in just any Tom, Dick and Harry Institute. If you have to do it, only do it from FT30. And of course, nothing can be better than Howard Business School itself because of the network, because of the legacy. My two follow-up questions regarding your MBA at HBS is, number one, how much does it cost end-to-end -end if you now have an uh, estimate mm -hmm. of it? And what are certain creative ways of sponsoring it if you are not taking a debt? So that's number one. Number two, given that you have done management consulting, given that you have done Westbridge, what kind of goals do you have here when it comes to post-MBA goals? So do you have clarity or at least what did you tell HBS about it? So those are my two curiosities. Yeah, uh, on a cost front, it's a pinch on a pocket for sure. Uh, and uh, so I don't have the complete estimate, but for the first year, I think roughly it's about 110K. And assuming that it might be similar for the next year as well, 110K USD, so about 220K USD. So in, in INR terms, it, it comes out to about two, two crores, considering all the travel and you know other parts, because when you're going for an MBA, it's not just the tuition and it's not just the stay which matters, but you also Is travel. Is this including inclusive of the stay that you are going to take at HPS? Yes, this 220K is inclusive of the stay at HPS. And coming to know how to finance this, of course, uh, loan and debt is something which almost everyone takes. Uh, but HBS also has a very good uh, in endowment fund and uh, what happens and we have a financial aid application uh, and for which you can apply, but it is completely need based. So based on your past three years of salary, based on your household income and based on your background, etc. They take a call on, you know, how much scholarship would they want to offer you? Uh, that is something which is in progress and I still don't have clarity on whether, how much will I get. Uh, but that is completely need based. But uh, just to for the audience, there are other business schools who off also offer merit based scholarships. For example, Wharton, uh, Booth, Columbia, all of them have need uh, merit based scholarships as well. Uh, Stanford and Harvard are the two schools who do not offer any merit based scholarships. It's only need based. Uh, but on the merit based scholarships, there are ranges from fifty k USD to even 200k or even a full wave on uh, the entire tuition fee uh, based on your application and based on uh, how the school feels about your candidature. So there are different ways to, of course, get that financial aid. Um, but yeah, and sorry, I missed your second question. Uh, what are your goals post MBA at HBO? Oh, yes. Yes. So I think, uh, as you said, of course, I've explored a lot of different things, but I think Something which I've not really explored is actually building something grounds up. And uh, and that is something which, uh, you know, I mentioned my application I'm also excited for is actually explore product level technology based roles uh, to actually build something grounds up and see how that works. Right. Because I feel that as an investor or as a consultant, while of course you take learnings from others and then try to suggest your portfolios that, okay, let's try to do this. Let's try to do that. But if I have that experience of actually building something, implementing something, I'll actually have very hands-on experience and I can actually give them that guidance or that suggestion that, okay, this is something which you, you can try or this is something which I did. These are the challenges which I faced uh, and I can relate to a founder's or a company's challenge. So maybe long term, I want to do investing and come back to investing uh, because I feel that I enjoy the job. But uh, but in the short term, I might want to explore a product based implementation kind of role and actually st stick to something and build something there to see if, you know, how, what are the challenges which happen and actually see, if, you know, how and actually relate to a lot of founders who actually talk about these challenges, but I'm unable to relate to them currently. Got it. That does make a lot of sense. In fact, I had a colleague slash friend from my government of India days with very similar background, he joined HBS and then now currently is chief of staff to COO at Reddit. 
because he wanted mm-hmm. to experience uh, doing things rather than just suggesting things i have a follow up question to it because you mentioned your goals which is that uh, to my mind you're kind of very closely talking about product management or product development right which is grounds up okay. uh, when it comes to hps versus stanford i think more stanford as entrepreneurial as a product school close to technology it's in palo alto it's in bay area did you consider stanford if yes were you comparing hps versus stanford did you have an acceptance from stanford could you just shed light on that yeah uh, and i did apply to stanford as well and i think uh, had unfortunately did not get an acceptance there uh, i was called for an interview but uh, it did not work out but having said that if i had both acceptance offers it would have been a very very tough call to actually take uh, because by stanford is more entrepreneurial more and in a more tech based ecosystem the bay area ecosystem but of course as a brand value hbs has a much stronger legacy uh, and a larger alumni network so from that experience it would have been a tough call and to be honest i don't know the answer and i'm glad that i don't have to take that uh, uh, decision sure i really like that answer in some shape or format i believe that will give some motivation to someone because subham your profile is impeccable in the sense of pick marking everything right so uh, i believe this is also a good note on which someone can get some motivation that uh, few rejections are part of getting few acceptances yeah. right uh, with that i am going to wrap up this podcast i had a very good time uh, thank you so much once again for being a G- mentor to gji fellows and uh, for doing this podcast and i wish you nothing but all the best in cambridge it's going to be a life once in a lifetime journey happy to hear if you have any last comments before we wrap up no this was fantastic sadakshi and thank you for having me here i really lo- loved and enjoyed the conversation and uh, and yeah i'm uh, excited to be a gj mentor and help other fellows and hopefully come to hbs and you know uh, be hbs alums in the future all right i really hope that you got to educate yourself and enjoy yourself during this uh, podcast so feel free to share it with your friends and of course like this video to actually motivate uh, people like me whenever i am on breaks uh, from beautiful locations i shoot these really cool videos for all of you and this is just one of the many more interesting podcasts that i am going to have on this channel if you want to request for certain kind of professions on my channel uh, feel free to let me know in the comment section and of course i have always maintained if you want to build a career in management consulting product management and public policy and if you need more help feel free to check out global governance initiative impact fellowship at globalgovernanceinitiative.org i'll see you very much soon ciao